Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. There are many videos on YouTube which discuss the possibility of ancient high technology, which we believe existed due to the precise stonework of ancient architecture seen around the world. The stone monuments often contain some of the hardest naturally occurring rocks in the world, such as diorite and granite, that were shaped so perfectly and had a clean smooth finish. And today, in the 21st century, with lathes and diamond bit drills, we still cannot replicate some of the ancient stonework. Just look at this perfect hole through a huge piece of Egyptian granite. How did they do it? And how did they produce this perfectly concave finish on another piece of hard igneous rock? And look at this pre-dynastic Egyptian vase, hollowed out from a single piece of solid diorite, not to mention the perfect internal right angles inside the so-called sarcophagus of the Great Pyramid. In Cairo Museum's Old Kingdom rooms, you can find dozens of vases, bowls, boxes and statues carved from granite, diorite, schist and obsidian, and there is no easy answer as to how such intricate shapes are achieved with such precision. Modern stonecraft experts have no idea how such objects were made with a limited technology available. We are told by archaeological experts that the ancient Egyptians used tools such as pounding balls, copper chisels and stone hammers. The Old Kingdom stone artefacts have clean lines and perfect proportions, and the giant diorite and granite statues have satin smooth surfaces and delicately carved features as if coming from a mould. Professor Ivan Watkins, a geologist and stonework expert from St Cloud State University in Minnesota, investigated some of the stonework in microscopic detail. He says that the primary indicator of how a stone was processed or worked is the condition of the surface of the material at microscopic level. During his investigation, he found that Inca and Egyptian stonemasonry had similar workmanship, indicating that the same technology was available across both nations. Hard igneous rocks are extremely difficult to cut, and a mechanical and physical method of cutting them would leave uneven mineral surfaces, as the rock would naturally crack along low angles if it was hammered. Stones like granite contain a mix of minerals with varying degrees of hardness, and when force is applied to the stone surface, for example hammering, grinding, polishing with abrasives, it would cause the weaker planes to crack naturally and the tougher parts to keep together. The ancient stonework in the aforementioned Egyptian and Inca monuments and stoneware shows smooth and slick surfaces, which means that scientifically they were not cut using the methods stated by archaeologists. Watkins discovered evidence that some stones certainly underwent extreme heat during modification, so much so that quartz melted into a glaze that filled in irregularities to make a smooth, vitreous surface. Watkins and other researchers have seen these slick stones in various Inca stone masonry at various sites throughout Peru, having what looked like a ceramic glaze. They almost have a plastic look about them. But how did they do it? He found one clue in the bracelet worn by a modern day priest in Cusco, Peru. In the annual festival of the sun, a priest lit wisps of cotton on fire using a bracelet, which is designed with a highly polished concave indentation to focus the sun's rays. He then found a cache of large parabolic golden bowls kept in a Peruvian museum that seemed to be constructed like golden mirrors that would be able to magnify and concentrate sun rays. If they were in fact an alloy of gold and silver, it would have had fantastic reflective properties. But can sunlight actually cut stone? Watkins points to the Conquistador's records mentioning an Inca golden dish that was so large it spanned the length of two men. The sacred artefact was apparently cut up and melted by invaders and shipped back to Spain. Could this have been large enough to concentrate the sun's energy into an almost laser-like beam? Watkins certainly believes so, and he states that an object of this size and made of gold-silver alloy would certainly be able to cut even the hardest of rocks. Consulting with geologist David Lindroth, Watkins tested his ideas in a number of experiments, and he found out that rock could be cut with a 100 watt laser, focused at an area 2mm in diameter. 
he found that repeated passes using the same power can cut any stone down to size. The light cutting through the stone is called thermal disaggregation. Watkins speculates that the big granite bedrock posts at Machu Picchu look like a place to hold huge mirrors for stone cutting purposes. Peru, like Egypt, gets very strong sunlight all year round. The huge dishes allow the Incas to cut rock in a very precise fashion, and we can see that the blocks are so closely matched that a knife blade cannot be inserted between them. Another legend in the book Secrets of the Andes by Brother Philip mentions sacred golden discs too. It states that one Inca priest of the Temple of the Seven Rays, named Amaru Meru, fled from his temple with a sacred golden disc, known as the Key of the Gods of the Seven Rays, and hid in the mountains of Hayu Masa. The discs were clearly of great importance to the Incas, and it is important to note just how strongly ancient civilizations worship the sun. Maybe some of the sun discs we see in ancient art are not actually esoteric depictions of the sun, but literal discs that focus the sun's rays, so that the ancients could harness its energy on earth. Maybe this is the lost ancient technology that would explain so much about ancient construction methods. The amplification of sunlight to silently cut and shape stones as hard as granite, to build magnificent structures and objects, and to seemingly drill perfectly spherical holes. Watkins says that his theory evolved after he noticed a glaze on the wall of a cave that contained Inca stonework, and you can only get a glaze by heating the rock to quite extreme temperatures. Watkins has since patented a solar-powered stone cutting and polishing device that he says was influenced by Inca and Egyptian technology. The idea of ancient lenses being used to harness the power of the sun was discussed at length in Robert Temple's book The Crystal Sun, rediscovering a lost technology of the ancient world, the most secret science of the ancient world. He finds evidence for the technology in Greece, Egypt and the ruins of Troy, which he believes has been misidentified. In fact, Temple has found more than 450 ancient optical artefacts, most of them being crystal lenses, but in any case, magnifying aids. Heinrich Schleimann, the 19th century discoverer of Troy, excavated 48 rock crystal lenses. Another hoard was found in Crete, and there are many examples in Mesopotamia and Egypt, mainly from the Old Kingdom. I don't believe, as many claim, that the ancient Egyptians harnessed electricity to power tools such as drills, because, as far as we know, there have never been any electrical items found. But researchers have found evidence of ancient lenses, and together with the golden discs of South America, we now know that there was a way to melt stone, cut it, and fit it together using the power of the sun. Thank you for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. Please like this video, please comment below, and please subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much.